Good morning and a happy and blessed Easter to you. And if you would please, in your Bibles, would you turn to Matthew 28, verse 5. Matthew 28, verse 5. Last Saturday, the day before Palm Sunday, the White House Coronavirus Task Force held a press conference and made a dire announcement. They warned that the next several weeks would be the most consequential in the nation's effort to combat the deadly virus. <clears throat> the president, appearing at the conference, spoke these ominous words. There will be death. Also at the conference, an important announcement was made by Dr. Deborah Burks. She said, the next two weeks are extraordinarily important. And then she went on to say, this is not the moment to go to the grocery store or pharmacy. And so I went to the grocery store. If the White House task force is as smart as they appear, and I think they're doing a great job, they had to realize that if we are being asked to not go to the grocery store for two weeks, we're going to need to go to the grocery store. And so off I went to gather some essentials I needed, or we needed, milk, eggs, bread. And when I got to the grocery store, it was clear that I was not the only one who thought that way. There were many others there as well. And if you've been to the grocery store recently, I didn't, needn't tell you what a surreal sight that is. Going to the stop and shop looks like a scene from a Hollywood movie that was once advertised and released as science fiction. Shoppers wearing gloves, scarves, and surgical masks. And as I walked the aisles, I couldn't help but notice the faces of some of my fellow shoppers. Beneath the masks was the look of fear. And if I tried to tell you that I wasn't fearful, I would be lying. We are getting weekly emails from Fairfield's first select woman to give us an update on how many of our neighbors have recently contracted this virus and how many have died. And these numbers, both locally and nationally, are tragic and fearful. As we think about fear, it should be pointed out that behavioral experts distinguish between two kinds of fear, rational fear and irrational fear. If I refuse to leave my house because I'm worried about being hit by a meteor, that would be an irrational fear. The probability of being hit by a meteor is effectively zero. But in the midst of a pandemic, if I refuse to travel on a crowded New York City subway, I think we will all agree that is a rational fear. We might even call that a healthy fear because the risks are real and there is a clear and present danger. Is there a danger going to the stop and shop? Dr. Burks of the White House Task Force thinks so and suggests that we not go. We are being told by government officials not to panic, but to demonstrate a healthy fear. As our nation is in crisis, and most of us will likely have some level of fear it is fitting that we consider with special interest 
the biblical text that is before us today. And that text is the one that describes the most important event of world history. That, of course, is the day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. On this day, the day that we refer to Easter, or as some prefer, Resurrection Sunday, there is an important message that we will hear from God's Word. And what is that message? It is this. Do not be afraid. When the followers of Jesus Christ first discovered the empty tomb, the first words that were given to them were, do not be afraid. Those words are important every day, but they are especially important today, this Resurrection Sunday, as we face a world that is full of uncertainty and fear. Let's look now to the first part of this message that comes from the heavenly messenger that was delivered on that first Resurrection Sunday. Let's look, please, at Matthew 28, verse 5. <clears throat> the angel said, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. This message from heaven, which is a timeless message, tells us, do not be afraid. And the reason that is given that we need not be afraid is clearly announced by the angel. Jesus Christ, who was crucified, is risen, just as he said. As we hear this message, do not be afraid, I will need to make a quick clarification. This message from heaven is potentially available to all people, but it is meant, it is meant for and specifically given to the followers of Christ, to those who by faith are born again. And as we will see and be reminded today this morning, the reason that born-again believers need not be afraid is because Jesus Christ has defeated the grave. Because Christ defeated the grave, he promises that all who put their faith in him have eternal life. And therefore, we who believe in Jesus Christ have no reason to fear the grave. The reason this angelic message from above is so important is because there is simultaneously the opposite message that comes from below. You see, while the message from heaven is do not be afraid, the message that is delivered by Satan and his messengers is be very afraid. And how do the devil and his messengers cause fear? It is by introducing questions and whispers of doubt. This has been Satan's strategy from the very beginning. Do you remember what Satan said to Eve in the garden? That deceiver said to Eve, did God really say you must not eat from the tree? And what was the purpose of that devilish question? It was to plant doubt. It was meant to cause Eve to question the goodness of God. And when that doubt took root, it was just a matter of time before Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And by their disobedience, sin 
and death entered the world. But now, into this sin-plagued world, God's angelic messenger declares an affirmation that counteracts Satan's questions of doubt. And what is the remedy to doubt and to fear? The angel declares in no uncertain terms, and here is the remedy to fear. God always keeps his promises. The angel explains that Jesus Christ is risen exactly as he said. He is risen just as he foretold that he would. So here's the key point. Christ's resurrection is the ultimate proof that God always does what he says. God always keeps his promises. But let's think further about Satan's strategy of fear and doubt. You may have noticed what occurs every week, I'm sorry, what occurs every year during this holy week. There are a number of television specials that appear this kind of time of year, that appear on the cable channels, that promise to explore the death and resurrection of Jesus. And here's how they always start out. Christians believe. Now that is designed to sound objective and scholarly. But let's bear in mind that these shows appear on the very same channels that produce so-called documentaries that suggest that the pyramids were built by space aliens. And so when these so-called documentaries announce Christians believe, it is often the case that their goal is essentially the same as that of the serpent in the garden, to cause doubt. If you listen carefully to these so-called documentaries, they sound suspiciously similar to those first words spoken in the garden. Did Jesus really rise from the grave? Friends, the message from heaven is clear. He is risen, just as he said. But this world, led by its dark prince, wants us to live in doubt. This world wants us to live in a constant state of fear. If you're not sure that's the case, that the world wants us to live in a constant state of fear, think of the news media. I have observed the news media for many years, and there is one thing I can say for certain. Its primary goal is to stoke fear and doubt. As an example, of that assertion. Consider some recent reporting about the coronavirus. A few weeks ago, the president said that he was feeling encouraged because doctors in Europe were successfully treating patients with a medication that has been used for decades to treat malaria. He then suggested that doctors in this country also use this medication. Well, the media launched into a frenzy of criticism. This is an outrage, they said. The president is promoting an untested drug. And he's doing this all while giving people false hope. Well, as I was hearing this nonstop criticism, it seemed to me that these so-called media experts preferred that the public live 
in hopelessness. Here was a a ray of light in a dark world, and they were saying, stop this talk about hope. It's as if they wanted people to live in a constant state of fear. It was as if they couldn't stand the possibility that there might be some good news. But let's ask this question. Why is the media so laser focused on bad news? And in a related question, why is mankind in general so preoccupied with bad news? I don't know for certain, but I suspect that part of the reason is this. Satan wants people focused on bad news. I suggest that the reason Satan wants people focused on bad news is to distract them from hearing the good news. And what I mean, of course, is the good news of Jesus Christ. And here is that good news. Because of what Christ did for us on the cross, giving his life in exchange for ours, we are given the most wonderful of promises that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen now. Knowing that all who believe are given everlasting life, is that not a powerful remedy to fear? Knowing that our eternal future is secure, isn't that a powerful remedy to fear? Let's go back to Matthew's account of that miraculous morning. We will want to pay special attention to the message delivered by the angel, but before we do, let's consider how Matthew sets the scene. Let's go please to Matthew 28, verse one. Matthew 28, verse one. And as I read, I'd like to interject a few interpretive comments. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week, meaning Sunday, began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. We know from the other Gospels that there were other women on this visit, but Matthew chooses to focus on these two. And when Matthew says that they went to look at the tomb, we can best understand that to mean that they went to look after the tomb. And that's because both Mark and Luke tell us that the women were on their way to further anoint the body with spices. Verse two, and behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. <clears throat> Contrary to some erroneous teaching and some misleading paintings that depict the scene, it is not the case that the angel rolled back the stone <clears throat> to let Jesus out the angel rolled away the stone to let the women in. <clears throat> now to verse 5. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come. See the place where the Lord lay, 
And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. As we consider these words, let's remember the role of angels. The Greek word angelos, where we get our word angels, literally means messenger. And so as this messenger sent from heaven speaks to the women, we recognize that these words did not originate with the angel, but with God. Which means that when the angel says such things as, do not be afraid, these words are not the angel's suggestions, these are the words of God. And because they are the words of God, they are a command. And when God gives a command such as, do not be afraid, it is for good reason. And here is that reason. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. The antidote to fear, which is also the definition of faith, is being fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he says. And hear what the angel says. Do not be afraid. Why? Because God has the power to do just as he says. He is risen, just as he said, just as he foretold that he would. God keeps his promises. And if we know that Jesus Christ is risen, there is something else about which we can be absolutely sure. Everything else that he has ever told us, everything that he has ever promised will also happen just as he said. And so, when Jesus says that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, we know that will happen, just as he said. Let's look now at the three commands relayed by the angel. And each command is significant because what I'd like to demonstrate is that these three commands all alleviate fear. Each command is designed to alleviate fear, not just for those women going to the tomb, but for every follower of Christ in every generation. <clears throat> the first command is this, come, as in come forward. As the woman, women stood outside the tomb and they looked at the opening of the tomb, there was so much that might have hindered them from going forward, fear, doubt. But ultimately, they recognized that this invitation to come forward was given by God himself. As the women were invited to come on that Sunday morning, so does God invite us to come forward on this Sunday morning. He is speaking to each of us when the Lord says to us, Come unto me, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, Jesus says, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. When Jesus invites us to come to him for the purpose of giving us rest, he is, of course, speaking about a special kind of rest. Not the kind of rest that might be found in kicking back in a lazy boy recliner. No, the kind of rest that Jesus gives is rest for the soul. And there is no greater rest than the rest for the soul. 
Now let me ask you a question. Would knowing that you have been saved from death and given eternal life, does that give you rest for your soul? Absolutely. Knowing that our future is eternally secure, that is a blessed assurance. And that, my friends, is a rest for the soul. Let's look at the second command given by the angel. It is C. The angel invites the women, come and see where he lay. The angel invites the women to see the empty tomb. And why does God extend this invitation? Why does God extend this invitation through the angel to come and see? Well, it is so that they would be assured that he had in fact risen, just as he said. This was the first of many evidences of Christ's resurrection. But in terms of the empty tomb, many critics want to discredit this piece of evidence. And for those who want to deny Christ's resurrection, their go-to explanation is that the body was stolen. But let's ask this question. If the body was stolen, who might have stolen it? Well, there are only two possibilities. The enemies of Jesus or the followers of Jesus. If his enemies stole the body and they were later faced with the growing belief that Jesus had rose from the dead, all they had to do was produce the body to put an end to this talk about a risen Christ. But they did not produce the body because they did not have a body. The other explanation, which is the one usually offered by the critics of Christianity, is that the disciples stole the body and then claimed that he had risen. But if the disciples stole the body, consider this. Of the original 12 apostles, 10 were martyred for their bold proclamation that Christ had risen from the dead. Does anyone think that the apostles would have endured the agonizing death of crucifixion just to keep up a fabricated story? Of course not. There is only one explanation for the empty tomb. He is risen, just as he said. There is another important reason why we are invited to come and see the empty tomb. Not just the women, but for every living person. And this reason was suggested by the 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon suggested that it is imperative that with our mind's eye, all people look into the tomb. The reason being is so that we are reminded that one day every one of us will surely die. There is a tomb, there is a burial place waiting for each and every one of us. But what we do today, as we look into Christ's empty tomb, is crucial. You see, if we look into that tomb and we look with doubt, the result will be fear. Fear for the future. And of, the, our, and of the tomb that awaits us. But if we look into Christ's tomb with faith, knowing that Jesus Christ was raised just as he said, then we too can know that we too will be raised. Listen please to these words from Jesus. This from John chapter 6 verse 40. 
For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Does this promise that those who believe are given victory over the grave, does the promise that you have everlasting life, does that chase away fear and give you rest for your soul? The third command given by the angel is this, go and tell. We might wonder why the angel is telling the women something that seems so obvious. Their beloved friend, Jesus, was just raised from the dead. Wouldn't they automatically want to go and tell others about this? Well, let's, th let's realize this. The angel would not have commanded them, God would not have commanded them to go and tell unless there was a real possibility they would not go and tell. Hmm. Well, let's think about why that might be. I think we can all agree that when the women heard the good news that Jesus had, had been raised from the dead, they were thoroughly relieved. A few minutes ago, they were convinced that Jesus, who was crucified, dead, and buried, had been taken from them forever. But now, they get the good news, he is risen. He is alive again. And so, while they were certainly feeling many things, one of them, of course, had to be relief. But relief can have a strange effect about which we ought to be aware. Let's use an illustration. Let's imagine a hypothetical person. This person is awaiting the results of a test, a medical test, that will indicate the possibility of a serious, perhaps a fatal illness. And so there's a feeling of anxiety. There's a feeling of fear of the unknown, of not knowing what the future will bring. But then the results come back and all is well. That person is going to feel a sense of relief, are they not? The, the muscles relax. There may even be a, a sigh of relief. And don't we have a saying for that? That person, now has, that person has now been put at ease. Now here's the point. While the good news of Jesus Christ does indeed give us rest for our souls, he does not intend for us to put our bodies at ease. When we have been given the good news that Christ has risen and that all who believe in him have eternal life, that should not say to us, now's the time to sit back and take it easy. We're not told to wait and sit around for, uh, until heaven arrives for us. No, that's not what we're told. We're not put at ease. We are told... Go and tell. Let's look, please, at verse 8. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. Did you catch that description? They left the tomb with fear and great joy. Is it possible to experience two opposite emotions at the same time? Of course it is. Isn't it true that people sometimes cry at weddings? They're so happy, they cry. Is it ever the case when a father meets his newborn infant child, he cries? Of course. He's so happy, he cries. 
These women, they're afraid and yet filled with joy. Two seemingly opposite emotions, afraid yet filled with joy. Well, that description suggests to me two things. First, removing fear in our lives is a process. Removing fear or anxiety from our lives is not like throwing a light switch. Telling someone not to worry or to not be afraid is like telling somebody, don't be hungry. Just as there are times when we are going to be hungry, there are times when we are going to be afraid. But, as we come and see that Christ's tomb is empty, that he has defeated the grave, and that he has promised that all who believe in him have also defeated the grave, I suggest that our fear decreases as our joy increases. The second observation I'd like to make about this description of the women leaving the tomb with fear and great joy is this. I believe that when we are obedient to this command to go and tell, that is going to bring us joy. Here's why. Notice what happens when they are obedient to the command to go and tell. Look please at verse 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them. Friends, I want to tell you something important. Jesus is always closest to us when we are telling others about him. When we go and tell another person the good news of Jesus Christ, Jesus is right there with us. But you needn't take my word for it. Look at the word of God. When the women went to go and tell, notice what happens, verse 9, Behold, Jesus met them. When we are obedient to the word of God, that is when we are closest to Christ and he to us. Question. Knowing that Christ is with us, that he is going to never leave us nor forsake us, doesn't that have a tremendous impact in reducing our fear and increasing our joy, giving us great joy? Let's notice now what Jesus says to the women. As we continue in verse 9, Jesus met them saying, Rejoice. Some translations, such as the NIV or the ESV, has the word greetings. Jesus meets the women and says, Greetings. The word that is used in the Greek text literally means rejoice, but by Jesus' day, the word had become a casual and an informal way to greet a close friend. To put it in our modern day parlance, it would be similar to Jesus appearing to these women and simply saying, hi. And what makes this greeting so surprising is that this is such an ordinary greeting considering the monumental importance of this occasion. This is the first appearance of the risen Christ. And we might have expected something much more extravagant. If I was arranging this occasion, I would have had marching bands, royal pageantry, a a, a nationwide presentation. But what does Jesus do? He appears to just a handful of close friends with a simple greeting that essentially means, hi. Didn't Jesus say when he was describing himself, I am gentle and humble in heart? Yeah, he did. 
And at that very same time, he said, learn from me and I will give you rest for your souls. The relief we seek, the remedy we need to fear, the rest for our souls that we need, this will not be found in extravagant pageantry, but how we respond to Jesus Christ. Look again at verse 9, the end of verse 9. Notice how the women respond. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. They knew with certainty that this was Jesus, risen from the dead. And there was only one proper response to the risen Christ, worship. And so they did what every person ought to do when they put their faith in the risen Christ, fall to their knees and worship. Hmm. Scholars have posed a fascinating and intriguing question at this point. Here's that question. Why did Jesus choose to appear to these women first? Why didn't he go to his apostles first? Well, there have been many suggestions, but I find the explanation that's been offered by John MacArthur both, both simple and elegant. He suggests that the angel and then Christ himself appeared to the women first simply because they were there. Had the apostles been there rather than hiding in the upper room, if the apostles had been there tending to Christ's tomb, they too would have heard the good news directly from the angel. And they would have met Christ sooner rather than later. MacArthur writes, The closer a believer stays to the Lord and his work, the more he or she is going to witness and experience the Lord's power. I would add this. We cannot see, we cannot expect to see the miraculous hand of God if we are merely sitting around and waiting, biding our time until heaven. We will see God at work and we will see his many miracles if we stay close to Christ. If we are obedient to his command, go and tell. Let's go back to the text at verse 10. Then Jesus said to them, <clears throat> Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Jesus repeats the same words that were given by the angelic messenger. He's, he says to the women now, do not be afraid. He knew they were still afraid, but once again, he calms them. He says, do not be afraid. And why? There was no reason to fear. And the reason they need not fear was obvious. Jesus was right there with them. By his very presence, he was speaking to their hearts, I am with you. Jesus further defines the task they had already been given by the angel. The angel said to them, go and tell. Now, Jesus says to them at verse 10, go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. This does not mean that Jesus' first appearance to the apostles would occur in Galilee, no. The Bible tells us that Jesus appeared to the apostles many times in Jerusalem before he then met them in Galilee. One of those appearances included the time that Jesus told Thomas, see 
the holes in my hands and put your hand in my side. And what did Thomas do? He responded by saying, my Lord and my God. But what is the significance about Jesus appearing to his apostles in Galilee, in that northern area? Well, that northern area would say a great deal about the scope of their ministry and ours. Let's bear in mind that the region that was in Galilee was commonly known to the Jews as Galilee of the Gentiles. It was actually the home to both Jews and Gentiles, but therefore it was representative of the world as a whole. And what is the message that Jesus will give them at Galilee? Well, it is, of course, go and tell. Jesus tells his disciples both then and now what we are to do after we have believed and after we have been given eternal life. Let's go please to verse 19. And at their meeting in Galilee, Jesus says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. This command is meant for Jesus' disciples of every generation. And as we hear this command, we know that no matter what we might face, we need not fear. We don't need to fear death. We don't need to fear opposition. We don't need to fear anything. And he tells us why we need not fear. Because Jesus gives us this promise. I am with you always. And on this Resurrection Sunday, let's be reminded, it is and will be just as he said. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, on this day we celebrate all that you have done and all that you are. We are forever grateful that by your death and resurrection, death has been swallowed up in victory. We thank you also that all who believe in you share in that victory. And Lord, help us to remember that you are all, that you are with us always. And by that remembrance, fear is replaced by joy. Amen.